For our next presentation is Building Psychologically Healthy Workplaces by Al Bieksa from the BC Federation of Labor. Uh, Al also is the father of Kevin Bieksa, the ex-Canuck, now and I'm Duck. And uh, is, isn't his wife one of those writers or something now that's getting into a lot of trouble? Huh? Yes, yes. Welcome, Al. Thank you very much, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning. So good morning, it's uh, actually I'm very, very overwhelmed to be here this morning. I'm very honored, first of all, because uh, we're here on uh, the unceded territory of First Nations and we have the privilege of making these presentations. But secondly, I noticed that the steering committee are honoring uh, Orange uh, Shirt Day. September 30th, Orange Shirt Day, every child matters. So it's my privilege to be able to speak on uh, such an important day. And uh, as uh, my introduction said, yeah, my. As my introduction said, I am the father of uh, Kevin Bjexson. He's very proud of me, and uh, you know, he's okay as a kid. And I gotta tell you, I was pretty impressed because I was at the back of the room this morning when you had the moment of silence and you put up all those people who've died in Forest Street. And it's pretty sad, isn't it? And I know I participate in the Day of Mourning every year. And I've been doing it for over 40 years, participating in the Day of Mourning ceremony or some type of worker memorial days. And I know that there was an awful lot of people up on that screen, way too many people. I know last year, there was 161 people that died because of their workplace, or at their workplace. And I know the year before, there was 187 people that died. And I know before that here in British Columbia, there was 173 people that died. And I keep saying to myself, I can't believe, you heard that dynamic presentation by Shane a couple of speakers ago, all the technology that we've seen. Some of you are baby boomers like me in this room, and you remember what it was like to watch the first person land on the moon. It was on a 13 inch black and white TV. That's all we had. We listened to hockey games on the radio. That's how far technology has come in a short two or three decades. And today, oh my goodness, look at the technology we have today, like these high definition projectors and, uh, and the cell phones that you have in front of you. We've mastered space travel. We can, go to the, we can go to Mars. And don't volunteer for that trip. It's a one way trip. Read the fine print, 45 years. We've cloned animals. We're now talking about having uh, automated cars that we won't have to drive anymore. So please, this is a very intelligent group here. Please, somebody in this group, tell me, with all that technology that we have today, why we can't do a better job of preventing people from getting killed in the workplace. Never mind getting injured, just getting killed in the workplace. Because what is the acceptable number for workplace fatalities, as far as you're concerned, everybody in this room? Does anybody say it's uh, acceptable to be more than zero? No, we all believe it's zero, but it never happens. We're always talking about hundreds of people getting killed every year. And across Canada, it's the same. It's like a thousand workers die because of their workplace every single year. And we're not trending in the right direction. Seems like it's the same number almost every year. So why is it with all this technology, we can't come up with a way that we can prevent people from getting killed in the workplace? And I know the answer and you're not gonna like it. And you might not even agree with me, but here it is. In Canada, it is socially acceptable for people to get killed in the workplace. Socially acceptable to get killed in the workplace. It's a cost to doing business. And this isn't propaganda from the government or from WorkSafe BC or from employers or from unions and all this. It's a stated fact. Because if we didn't accept it, we would change it. And we've changed socially unacceptable things in the past. I want you to think, and you're all old enough to remember drinking and driving. Drinking and driving. I remember when I was 19 or 20 years old, driving around in southern Ontario. Everywhere I drove, I drove with an open bottle of beer on my lap. I drove with an open bottle of beer on my way to work, outside of work, everywhere I went. So did my dad, so did my brother, so did all my friends. I remember coming home after afternoon shift and stopping at the pub, closing the pub getting pulled over by a cop two blocks away as they came out of the pub, and I fell out of my pickup truck. I was so drunk trying to get my license out of my back pocket. And the cop picked me up and laughed at me and said, clearly, kid, you haven't learned how to hold your liquor yet. You better fall in behind me and uh, follow me and I'll get you home. And when I woke up on the morning, I was so drunk that night that I'd actually missed the driveway and parked on the lawn, which did not make the wife very happy. But in any event, do you think that that would happen today? Do you think that you would go to the bar across the street after this present? You're going to need a drink after my presentation. 
But you think you would go over there and have three or four drinks and then think about getting into your car like we used to and go, ah, I can still see with one eye, I can see enough of the road to get my cell phone. No, no, you would never think about it. Why? Because the society's attitude towards drinking and driving has changed. And who changed it? I would argue with you, it's not what the government did. It's not what anybody did other than small, underfunded organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers or Mad Canada, who made it their mission not to change the law, because we've had laws on drinking and driving prohibition since 1936 in Canada, but they made it their mission to change the attitude of society. And they did it very convincingly with billboard ads and radio ads and, and TV ads, and everywhere we turned, we saw this advertisement about somebody losing a dear one because of a drunken driver, and almost overnight, the law started to change, and, and now there was all these roadblocks, and people were doing breathalyzers on you, and all of a sudden, it's no longer social, socially, socially acceptable to drink and drive anymore. And let me share a secret with you if you don't already know this, and I gotta lower my voice because if my boss hears me, I'll probably get fired for saying this out loud, especially in front of 400 people, and especially because I'm probably being filmed. You could take all the training, in the world on health and safety. You can go all the conferences in the world on health and safety and it will never ever make a stitch of difference unless you can take something from those conferences, something from that training that will help you start to change attitudes in the workplace. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference. And I heard one of the speakers this morning talking about that sign about uh, safety first and foremost and all that. And as long as that sign is just a sign that gathers dust that nobody even sees anymore, Nothing will ever change in the workplace. That sign has got to be a commitment. And it's not just a commitment of management or the employer or the government. It's got to be a commitment of every single person that walks through that door or through that planned gate to go into work that nothing is more important than my health. And I refuse to expose myself or anybody I work with to any hazard in there. And when you start to change that attitude, then you will start stop seeing uh, the hundreds of people who die and get seriously injured every day in the workplace, or every year in the workplace. So today, I want to take you a little bit about a journey, talking a little bit about building psychologically healthy and safe workplaces. And I saw the survey results, and it was something like 69% of the participants, according to you, understand what the definition of, or how to build a psychologically healthy and safe workplace. So I'm assuming that high percentage means there's an awful lot of mill rights that probably said when they read the question, I'm not sure what this is, but if you give me the right tools and materials, I can build anything. And that's the only reason we got up to 69%. But we're going to talk about something that I think has been ignored for a long time. And most of you are probably on health and safety committees or health and safety activists. And I applaud you. You've done a good job in the last couple of decades of improving safety in our workplaces. But I want you to think about what you've done personally to improve health, in particular mental health in the workplace. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. So the organization I work for, it's been around since 2001, we're the biggest provider of health and safety committees training now in the province. We're funded by WCB, but we work for the BC Federation of Labor, the central labor body for all of uh, British Columbia. And so I want to start off this presentation very quickly talking about the definition of health. Now don't look at the slide, anybody, don't look at any of the slides here on the thing. And I'm going to ask you a question, do you think that you're healthy? And most of you should think about that answer are probably thinking, well, I don't have an injury right now, I don't have an illness, I don't have any stuff. No, I'm pretty healthy. But when we look at the definition of health, and then it includes a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just merely an absence of an injury or illness, it kind of changes how many people are going to put up their hands and say they're healthy. And the World Health Organization defines health as also including uh, self-esteem, job satisfaction, and a sense of control over your own life and security. So there's a lot of social aspects to being healthy too. It's not just a medical uh, question that you're answering. The statistics are very, very telling and this is scary. Did you know every year one in five Canadians will have a mental health issue? One in five every year. And in the course of their lifetime in this room, one in three people will suffer a mental health issue. One in three. One, two, three, one, two, wow. That's an awful lot of us. I suspect there's an awful lot of people in this room that already suffer a mental health issue. Or if you don't, you've got a family member or somebody that's close to your family or friends that's going through suffering with a mental health issue. And so this is a prevalent condition. And one of the problems is we don't know how prevalent it is. All we know that 
we have a lot of our members that seem to have kind of a couple days that they don't show up to work and when you ask them how they were I'm all right I just needed a couple stress days off or whatever because they don't want to divulge the serious symptoms that they may be going through and so if there's that many people that are suffering a mental health issue it's kind of a pretty good question and going I wonder who they are if they're all around me at your table there's probably one person there that's got some intimate experience with mental health issues Where's everybody else? Where are they hiding? And what do they want? I'm here and I'm listening to this guy talk about mental health. What do they need? Let me put up this little quick video that shows you who they are and what they need. I am a mother. I am a mother. A father. Son. Daughter. Brother. A sister. I am a student. Stay-at-home mom. Construction worker. Volunteer. I am loving. Smart. Funny. Generous. <laughs> Way too generous. I am all of the amazing things you see. But there's something you can't see. Or don't see. Something that I don't let anybody see. Like when I'm alone. In a room full of people. I can't get out of bed. And maybe I've gained weight. Or lost weight. Why do men always lose weight? <laughs> <sighs> it can get dark in here. Really dark. Addicted to food. The web. Work. Sex. Alcohol. Something to take the pain away. To feel happy. To feel something. Anything. Nothing. Because depression isn't a mood. It's not a passing thing. Or a bad day. It's a disease. I can't just get over it. It feels like I'm underwater. Drowning. And sometimes I think you'd be better off without me. I am telling you this. All of this. Because I need help. And you are my wife. My dad. My husband. My kids. My boss. So please, don't judge me. Leave me. Fire me. Please, be patient. Don't give up on me. Just be there for as long as it takes. Just because you can't see it, doesn't mean it isn't real. Mental illness is the number one disability and cause of premature death in Canada and every week there are over 500,000 Canadians who don't go to work because of a mental illness. That's a huge, huge issue. In, in regards to the economy, the Canadian economy, $51 billion is lost every year they calculate because of a mental illness. And 80% of employers who have surveyed say that it's the number one uh, leader of uh, the cause of short-term and long-term disability benefits. And even when somebody goes off or a broken leg or whatever, there's usually a psychological component to that complicates the matter in getting this person back to work. So therefore we know that it's a huge issue and why the federal government is pouring a lot of money and organizations like Great West Life and uh, uh, Bell Canada are putting millions and millions of dollars into a campaign to raise awareness. And this campaign started back in 2007. And uh, that was the creation of the Canadian Mental Health um, the Canadian Mental Health uh, Committee, uh, which was part of Health Canada. And they held their initial meetings right in Vancouver in 2009. They did a round table to see how we can actually influence workplaces. Because workplaces have always been the perfect social laboratory. That workplaces are that perfect environment where we can test things to see how well we're doing. And if we're not doing well there, we test strategies to see how we can actually start to influence society. And so one of the uh, benchmarks is absenteeism. And so when they look at the average absenteeism rate of being in Canada, 9.3 days, and in BC, it's, it's about 10 days for every year. We know that that's a hardship on workplaces. It's a hardship on the individual, but it's a hardship on workplaces, because that's not a law. If you've got a couple hundred employees that are taking 10 days off a year, uh, those spots have got to be filled. So I understand what a hardship that is, but when you take into account presenteeism, that now all the research is saying is a distant cousin of absenteeism, 
where a person actually is showing up for work, but they really can't concentrate on what they're doing. So you're not really getting a lot of value out of them sitting at their desk or at their workstation because they're not really performing uh, up to what the expectations are. And if you look at the statistics that say that presenteeism seven to nine times the rate of absenteeism, we're now talking about 70, 80, 90 days a year for every worker where they're just not performing because many of them um, are suffering through mental health issues. So again, we understand the definition includes more than just the absence of an injury or, or an illness. So when we try to understand uh, what mental health is, again, we turn to the World Health Organization that helps us with the definition that says, it's the capacity to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we face. Some of those challenges inside of work and a lot of those challenges outside of work. And you will commonly hear uh, the term psychological resilience in reference to your, to your ability to handle uh, stresses inside of work or outside of work and there's all kinds of training workshops on that. When we talk specifically about mental illness and strategies to prevent mental illness, understand that it's not just a, a, a psychological condition. It's a biopsychosocial condition. It's got three components to it, biological, psychological, and social. Social being the things in our lives uh, that don't do with the biological makeup of our bodies or our brains. So there's an awful lot of influences that come into um, a, a mental illness once it's developed. And so how are we doing in workplaces when it comes to building psychologically healthy and safe workplace or even considering mental health issues in the workplace? And let's be honest, for the most part, the exposures in workplace don't cause mental health issues. I mean, there are some. When there's a traumatic event in there and somebody's diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, or whatever, yeah, you can uh, connect that to the workplace. But a lot of these things, bipolar disorder, anxiety, panic attacks, agoraphobia, those things aren't really associated for the most part with workplace exposures. But these people have to come into work. And if they are having their symptoms triggered by exposures in the workplace, then you can understand how that results in the high rate of absenteeism, presenteeism, short-term disability, long-term disability, and that's what promotes all those statistics. So workplaces do have a very important role to play in improving the psychological health uh, right across society. So in regards to being prepared, we know that very few employers have any strategies already in place to address this whole issue of psychological health, very few of them. Because it hasn't been an issue for many, many years, it's actually been the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room being the analogy about there's an elephant there, but nobody wants to see it or talk about it. They, they want to get it out of their sight line so they don't have to address the issue. So now with all the resources that have been developed in the last couple of years, we've got the Canadian Mental Health Commission and the Canadian Mental Health Association and some other groups that have partnered together. The CSA group has now developed a national standard on psychological, healthy and safe workplaces. Now we've got a, actually a formal definition we can look at. And so the formal definition is a psychologically safe workplace is one that allows no significant injury to employees' mental health in negligent, reckless, or intentional ways. Hmm. Negligent, reckless, or intentional ways. And it goes on to say, a psychological healthy workplace is one in which every reasonable effort is made to protect the mental health of employees. So therefore, their vision statement is in alignment with that definition. The vision for a psychologically healthy and safe workplace is one that's actively working to prevent harm to workers' psychological health in those kind of uh, intentional, reckless, or negligent ways. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. Here are some of the guiding principles behind any new strategy that's supported by these initiatives. Guiding principles, the number one being, it's a shared responsibility. And I think Al before me was talking about how health and safety is a shared responsibility. Well, this is one of those shared responsibilities of mental health in the workplace. It's not just the employer's responsibility. It's not just the management's responsibility. It's not even just the union's response. It's a shared responsibility of everybody. And whether or not you're suffering with mental health symptoms or not doesn't mean you don't have a role to play in creating a supportive environment for people that are because we know the statistics are saying well, there's an awful lot of the people that are working beside us that are suffering a mental health issue, but they're afraid to divulge that they have a mental health issue. And I want you to think to yourself, 
why would somebody be uncomfortable in divulging that they have a mental health issue? And you know very quickly what the answer is, because they know they're going to be treated differently. It's called stigma, having negative perceptions about somebody because you don't understand what they're going through. And sometimes people are judged very, very easily. How many times do you remember either you saying or somebody that you know has said to a person who's going through a bout of depression and saying, come on, your life's not that bad, you gotta look forward to tomorrow, just suck it up and get over it, look forward to all the good things in your life. Because those people don't understand what we saw in that video. Depression's a disease. It's not one of those conditions that you can say, suck it up, and expect that the person can actually get over it. No more so than if somebody was suffering from cancer, do you think I could stand up here and say, stop having cancer? And you think that that's going to scare a person into sucking it up and getting stronger? No, it's a disease. Mental health issues are diseases. And the only way that you help somebody is with proper treatment. Sometimes medication, sometimes counseling, but also supportive environments. We know how healthy work is for us. We look forward to going to work. Ah, sometimes we don't look forward to going to work, but one thing we always look forward to is the paycheck. And I want you to think about this for a second. You enjoy your paycheck every two weeks or every week when you get it, and what if all of a sudden tomorrow morning you couldn't go to work anymore because you were diagnosed with a mental health issue? What's your contingency plan? Put up your hands if you've got $250,000 sitting in the bank somewhere for a rainy day because you're never going to be able to go to work again. Probably not too many people in here. And so you understand why we've all got to work together to start to improve the psychological health, to make them more supportive so when people are suffering mental health issues, first of all, they're not afraid to talk about them. So they can come back to work and they can ask for help. Much like a person with a back injury or shoulder injury, when they're struggling, they should be able to comfortably ask for some help, some assistance, that I can't do this task the way uh, I've always had to do it before because of my injury or whatever. And I think that there is a law that you all know, human rights, duty to accommodate, that basically says that we've got to accommodate that person. And so the same thing applies to mental health. And there are some good benefits if you need a business reason why you should be doing this, because most people accept the fact it's a, it's, a, it's a moral decision. It's a good thing morally to be doing this, looking after your employees and their health, not just their safety, but their health and their safety. But there are some good benefits to it, such as um, increased employee engagement, meaning how satisfied you are with your job, that you're happy to stay there, you want to finish your career at that workplace. That's employee engagement. You have a reduction of people that are accessing short-term or long-term disability benefits or weekly indemnity. You have an uptake on EAP services. You have less grievances or human rights complaints based on duty to accommodate or discrimination. Those are all signs or those are all positive consequences of having a mentally healthy and safe workplace. And so there is a business case to be made that the very small uh, investment that needs to be made uh, will end up with significant returns. So we know the number one trigger, number one trigger for every single mental health issue, whether it's anxiety, a mood disorder, psychotic episode, a PTSD, number one trigger is stress. So as a starting point, we need to start dealing with stress. And before you can deal with anything, you're all health and safety activists, you know you've got to determine kind of the root cause before you can take proper corrective action. So we need to understand a little bit about stress. So stress is defined as the body's physical, emotional, and mental response to some type of stimulus. And when we talk about negative workplace or unhealthy workplace stress, in most cases we're talking about where somebody has very high demands, responsibilities, but has very little control on how they carry out those job tasks or those responsibilities. That's kind of what workplace stress is. Now, not all stress is bad for you, and everybody will tell you this. We know that stress is good for us when it helps us rise to the occasion. I mean, let's face it, hockey players train themselves to be able to basically have that adrenaline pumping, have that very high stress level, but for a very short period of time a 30, 40 second shift, and how many times do you remember hearing on the, on the TV, oh, the Sedins have been caught out on the penalty kill there, and they've been out there for two minutes, and, all, and, not, and first of all, they don't kill penalties, so that was a made up thing. But in any event, it's not just the physical exhaustion that they're experiencing, it's also the emotional exhaustion of being out there for more than what their body can tolerate when it comes to stress. So it teaches us something about what we refer to as toxic stress. Toxic stress, 
is when you never get any relief. It's okay to be exposed to a little bit of stress that elevates your performance, that uh, rises your game in you, but if you don't get any relief from that, if you're going from one stressful situation to another to another, and it goes on day after day, week after week, month after month, sooner or later, you're gonna have a health problem related to toxic stress. Now, I don't want anybody to put up their hands when I ask you this question, but I'm gonna ask you this question. How many people here have significant stress in their lives, both at work or outside of work? Don't put up your hands, but think about the answer. How many people really know that their health problems, they have some health problems that are caused by the stress that they're going through, either at work or outside of work? Okay, so I didn't want you to put up your hands because I'm gonna do this, administer this very, very quick test on you. And I'm gonna be able to tell by your reactions, I'm going to watch you very closely, especially the people right here in the front row. You're the, I know you're the hecklers. That's why I'm going to pay a lot of attention to you. And so I'm going to administer this test. It's called the National Dolphin Test. It's kind of new. I've taken a week-long training on it, so I'm going to make sure that nobody's harmed when I administer this test. And it's called the National Dolphin Test because I'm about to put up the picture of two identical, two identical dolphins. They're identical. And if you stare at that screen and start to see, as you stare at the screen, that there are little differences in coloring, sizes, shape, all of a sudden one of the dolphins has got a tattoo and they didn't have it three seconds ago, then I want you to put up your hands. And if you start to see significant changes, I want you to put up both hands. And that's going to help me establish how significant uh, the stress in your life is and how it's impairing your health. So don't get nervous. Don't get nervous, I'm not gonna let you look at this uh, picture too long because looking at it too long will cause you some distress, but I'm gonna be able to tell how unhealthy you are. So sit up straight, look at whatever screen that you can see, take a deep breath, it's not gonna hurt you much, and get ready. And you might wanna write this down, if you got a pen handy, write down any of the changes you have so I know if it's color or size or whatever. You got a couple pens there ready? Okay, so this group's all ready to go, here we go. She's writing. She's writing. <laughs> no, she's not. So the whole point of that little stupid uh, exercise was I tried to elevate your stress a bit. And for some of you, you were sitting there laughing because you know me and you know this is going to be a joke or whatever. But I wanted you to experience for anybody whose stress started to rise a little bit for whatever reason, what did you feel like when you saw the picture and you realized it was a gag? You felt, what an idiot. <laughs> I'm going for a coffee. But you felt that, and that's the difference between healthy stress and toxic stress. Toxic stress is when you never get that And sometimes you get that when you leave work and you go home. But it's really hard to do that because you've got kids and you've got a spouse and you've got hockey practice and you've got all these other things in your life. And you feel like you can never, ever take that breath and take that so you can feel a little bit better. And sometimes it gets so bad that we use things to help us. Alcohol prescription drugs, recreational drugs. We all have our addictions, peanut butter, chocolate, caffeine, whatever your addiction is, but you get addicted because you want relief. If I were to pull the whole room of what your addictions are, there'd be very few people in here that aren't addicted to something. And if I were to ask you, furthermore, what is the purpose of your addiction? What do you do this addiction for, whether it's to smoke pot or drink beer or eat gourds and gourds of peanut butter? Almost all of you would say it's pain relief, it's stress relief, and because that's how people manage their stress. And I don't think it's enough that agencies go out and teach people how to cope with their own stress. That's not enough. We've got an obligation under health and safety law to make sure that everybody is healthy, not just safe. And that includes mental health. And so there are some things that we can do and there's some tools that we can use. The first thing you gotta do if you want to build a psychologically healthy and safe workplace, except for Melrose, I'm not telling you how to do it, you've got your own tools, you do it. But for the rest of us, the first thing you need to do is identify the sources of what you feel is toxic stress. You can't do it on your own. You gotta do it through a survey or talking to other people and management and all that. And you can see up on my slide, I got kind of two categories. On the left-hand side, your left-hand side, there's the personal safety issues. And so if people are being stressed out because there seems to be constant threats of violence or actual violence, depending on where you work, or if they're stressed out because of bullying and harassment or even sexual harassment, or if they're stressed out because of a possible exposure to some type of physical hazard or chemical hazard or biological hazard or even ergonomic hazard, 
Or if people are stressed out because they feel that they're working with faulty tools and, and things are in repair or they don't have the proper tools. Or if people are stressed out because they don't feel that they're getting properly trained so that they can do their job safely. Or they're not confident that that young worker who just came in got proper training and now that they're putting us at risk. Those are all sources of stress that are characterized as personal safety factors. An easy solution for them is follow the regulation. Regulatory compliance. So start looking at it. So if people are worried about violence, you know 4.27 of the regulation says you got to do a risk assessment on violence. And then once you do your risk assessment and you do your assessment to see if you have moderate or high chances of there being violence, you've got to take corrective action. And you've got to minimize that hazard down to a level that's acceptable, that's safe. And maybe you've done that. I'm not saying that everybody hasn't done all those things, but maybe you haven't communicated to people. And so there's the strategy that empowers uh, the Joint Health and Safety Committee to seriously take a look at as part of your role, including looking for psychological, psychosocial hazards and addressing all those things that people are worried about on that one side. Now you see on the other side, here are some common stressors in workplaces that you can't really address that easily in legislation because there isn't legislation for the most part, specifically or regulations that address workload, or authoritarian style of management, if you work like in a paramilitary organization like BC Ferries, where people don't ask people to do something for them, they order them and you just do what I tell you to do, I know better, I'm the captain kind of thing, right? And then there's other issues like uh, having to work shift work, no flexibility in scheduling, mandatory overtime, no access to childcare. Those are all the things on the right hand list and we need to have some type of a strategy to start looking at those things too to create a, a healthy and safer environment. So here's one of the tools that we can use. So the CSA group developed a couple years ago a national standard called psychological health and safety in the workplace. You recognize the CA group, CSA group. They used to be called the CSA Association uh, responsible for doing standards. They started in 1919, right after World War I, ironically, because with the new age of technology, so many people were getting hurt. People didn't know how to handle electricity, for example, and, and motors, and you know, you had electricians that were licking the prongs of the plug before they put, no, not electricians, but you know what I'm saying. So the CSA group was originally formulated to kind of give us some standards, some training on how to use technology safely, without harm. And so they've now gone on to about 43 areas and health and safety is a big area of the CSA group. And they've uh, developed standards on ergonomics, on uh, health and safety management systems and all that. And so they, what they do is they set guidelines that help us as a tool so that we can have effective health and safety management systems in the workplace. Well, they just developed the tool on uh, psychologically healthy and safe workplaces. And it's because of the research saying that we can actually predict mental illness in the workplace by a lot of these factors that are on the slide there that are within the control of the workplace. Maybe not specifically within the control of the Joint Health and Safety Committee, but definitely within the control of the workplace. So this tool starts off by giving us some advice on, focus on two important areas what was on the right hand side of my uh, slide that I put up there with the sources of stress before. Focus on relationships. Relationships meaning how management treats workers, how workers treat co-workers, how clients interact with workers and co-workers, and focus on control. Having influence over the way you do your job, not control. Control's the wrong word over how you do your job. That's management's rights to kind of control how the work is uh, assembled and how it's uh, you know, uh, initiated and how it's directed. But have the ability to give workers the influence to say there's a better way of doing this or making sure that there's a fair distribution of workload and responsibilities and, and compensation and all those things that have a negative impact on people who have no influence because that's the one, is one of the biggest uh, risk factors. So remember that this is a voluntary standard so it shouldn't scare anybody away and it's not really rules, it's tools to give us some guidance. And there's a whole bunch of things in there that are important and we at the BC Federation of Labor Health and Safety Center are actually having a one day course on just how to understand the CSA standard. We call it implementation, but really you need a whole day to understand the standard and all these psychosocial factors. But the first psychosocial factor, PF1, talks about creating a psychological supportive environment. And that's the first step in any 
plan in order to uh, get people back to work or people stay at work that are suffering with either physical symptoms or psychological symptoms. And the biggest key in creating a psychologically healthy and safe workplace is to attack stigma. And as I said before, stigma is when people have a negative perception, negative attitudes about a group of people or a person they really don't understand. And sometimes that stigma is cultural, sometimes it's homophobic, but sometimes it's because they have negative attitudes they don't understand what mental health issues are. And that's when we start to get the comments, oh, just suck it up, it's not that bad, oh, depression, you ought to see my life, you think your life is bad, walk a mile in my shoes and you'll see what's bad. That's that lack of appreciation, that lack of understanding. And so the starting point in any workplace that's trying to improve psychological health has got to be in getting rid of the stigma associated. Now here's a famous quote. To give effect to the, uh, the principle of full participation in society as a constitutional right, the labor movement, unions, must now start to seriously grapple with the issues faced by people with mental health issues who are trying to work with a society that has traditionally criminalized, abused, and misunderstood them. That's a powerful statement taken, uh, taken uh, uh, responsibility uh, as the, oh wait a minute, I got the wrong picture up there. That wasn't uh, Donald Trump, it was Steve Hunt, District 3 director. That makes a lot more sense here. Some recognition that unions have a role to play. We have a role to play to make sure that this, this, this socially acceptable mental illness discrimination is actually put to a stop. And so we know, oops, sorry. I wanna put up this uh, quick video and I'm getting close to the end of the presentation. I know you keep on looking at me, looking at your watch there. How long is this doofus gonna keep on going on? But I wanna put up this uh, video and then the lesson is, what if we treated everybody like we treat people with mental illness? Is he okay? Come on, look at him. He's fine. He's not even bleeding. He's probably just looking for attention. Ah, he's just lazy. Oh, this is come on, man. I don't have time for this. He's fine. He's not even bleeding. He's just looking for attention. He's just lazy. That's why he's laying on the ground after being, can you, we would never do that. We would never accept that. If somebody said that on the sidewalk, everybody in this room would criticize that person. But yet, it happens every day when it happens to be mental health. We make these judgments, we make these criticisms, and, and we just think that this is a personal weakness. So in getting rid of stigma in the workplace, what we need to do is start to understand, first of all, that mental illness is that final frontier of socially accepted discrimination and start working at eroding the stigma associated with mental illness. So you've got a safe environment that people can talk about it and when they can feel safe about talking about it, they'll feel safe to ask for help. And then we can really engage uh, in improving psychological health. Because a lot of people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to admit it to anybody because of their fears. And there's lots of fears that people have that are stricken with a mental health issue. First of all, the fear of losing the employer's respect, of losing their job, of losing the opportunity for promotion somewhere down the road, the fear of how workers are gonna treat them when they find out they have a mental health issue. I, there's still people here that come to my classes that actually think when a person has a mental health issue diagnosis, it's a sin, or it's payment for a sin that they've committed against their God. There's still people that think that mental health issues are a communicable disease, that if I sit too close to you, I may catch your bipolar disorder. So that's that kind of reckless, ancient kind of thinking that we need to come up with a strategy uh, that kind of roads or eliminates. And so most discrimination, most stigma, negative perceptions, is based on a lack of understanding. We need to start thinking about the myths surrounding mental health and replace them with facts. 
Let's do, do that really quickly with five myths and five facts. The first myth being people with mental health issues are violent and dangerous. That's what a lot of people think. Oh my God, this person's got schizophrenia, they're gonna have a psychotic episode and they're gonna stab everybody with a knife. The facts are that's simply not true. They're no more dangerous with any mental health issue than anybody else. And in fact, ironically, they happen to be more victims than people without mental health issues. The second myth is people don't recover from mental health issues. Well, that's the same as you've never recovered from an injury. You never recovered from an And sometimes you don't recover from a disease, disease, but with proper treatment, medication, therapy, counseling, then you can um, lead a healthy and full life uh, to that point. The next myth is that people who experience mental health issues just can't work. They can't do a safety-sensitive position, and that's simply not true. The only thing that prevents, in most cases, a person with a mental health issue in coming back to work is systemic barriers in your workplace. You get rid of those systemic barriers in your workplace, there isn't anybody with a mental health issue that can't come back and do their job. Not just some job, but do their job. The next myth is people who experience mental illness are weak and can't handle stress. That's kind of funny. Because anybody that has a mental health issue, knowing that the number one trigger is stress, they've all gone for some type of stress coping, stress management, uh, techniques, skills, trainings. In fact, a person with a mental health issue is a way better position to handle a stressful situation than somebody that doesn't have a mental health issue. And the last myth, my personal favorite, and this is kind of where I'm going to end my presentation, is the myth that people think that mental health issues are a weakness. It's just a personal weakness by the person that's just not tough enough to get up over it. And that's where I want to finish off by talking about uh, the story of Rick Rippin. Now, some of you know who Rick Rippin is, and not everybody. There are people, not everybody in this crowd is a hockey fan, although there are a whole bunch of Leaf fans, I found out. But the people that are hockey fans, particularly if you're a Vancouver Canucks fan, you know the story about Rick Rippin, or you know some things about the story of Rick Rippin. But Rick and uh, my son Kevin started playing hockey at the same time, Manitoba Moose, and Kevin still tells his story. In 2003, when he was skating around on the ice, he was on a PTO, professional tryout, and he sees Rick Rippin jump onto the ice, and he says to one of his uh, uh, players there, Kevin does, and he says, wow, isn't that cool? The coach brought one of his kids out to skate around with all his professional hockey players. Because he actually thought he's one of the, he was so small and scrawny, and Kevin didn't know that he just finished playing four years for the Regina Pats as their captain. And he ended up in last place. There wasn't a lot of uh, people looking at players that played for Regina Pats. But one thing tells you when you got a C on your sweater, you probably have some leadership qualities. And it wasn't long before people were shaking their heads and going, wow, I can't believe how determined this kid is. And Rick went on to prove anybody that doubted him to be wrong. He not only made the Manitoba Moose and had a pretty successful couple seasons with them, he ended up signing a contract and playing six seasons for the Vancouver Canucks. What people didn't know about Rick is he suffered from a mental health issue. He suffered from a depression. And he got some treatment and twice he took a leave of absence from the team and he went to a rehab clinic down in Los Angeles. And when a little bit of that information was leaked out, I know most of the people in uh, British Columbia assumed, uh, another rich athlete, he's gotta go for uh, you know, some uh, treatment on their drug addiction or their alcohol addiction. He didn't have an addiction, he had a disease and it was depression. And some people suggest that, well, maybe it had to do with the fact that when he was playing for the Regina Pats, his girlfriend died in a car accident when she was coming up to see him play hockey. He never really, really got over that. And that might have been the triggering event of his tra traumatic uh, induced uh, depression. But the one thing that was undeniable is he went into these bouts of depression. He jumped in his car and disappeared. And he wanted to drive back to Crow's Nest, uh, Alberta. And Kevin and uh, his wife took him in. And for two years, he lived with them. And uh, Katie always tells the story about how she would spend sometimes nights up till three or four o'clock in the morning just talking him through an episode and talking him down and he had an awful lot of episodes. He was struggling. And the people that really don't know about Rick, you should know about this, about Rick, if you've never seen him play. There's many hockey players who are considered to be enforcers, those guys that play in the fourth line that really their role is to fight, who said about Rick Rippin, pound for pound, he's the toughest guy they ever went up against. And Rick could score, he could play some hockey, and he could fight, he never backed down from anybody. He was one tough SOB. And he was a million dollar athlete. And I know what it's like walking down the streets in Yale Town with a million dollar athlete beside you and everybody running over and wanting to take a selfie with you and your autograph and paying for your booze and you go to the restaurant and all that. It's kind of the life that a lot of us think that we would like to have. So here's a guy 
who's got the reputation of one of being the toughest guys in the NHL, who's a millionaire athlete, and he died by suicide, took his own life. He just had a boat, everybody thought he was okay, he just signed a contract with the Winnipeg Jets and he never showed up to camp, he never showed up on the plane. So when, 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 they met the, when they went to meet him at the plane, he just wasn't there. And when they actually phoned the father and uh, his father went down and to his cabin in Crow's Nest Pass, they found that he had died by suicide and hung himself. And then everybody blamed themselves because that's what happens when somebody dies by suicide. People who are left, who survived, blame themselves. And it's a tragic, tragic story, but the one thing it tells me, and Rick's not the only professional hockey player. A couple years before Rick, there was another hockey player, defenseman for the San Jose Sharks, and went through the same thing. Very successful hockey player, pretty tough kid, and ended up uh, taking his own life. He had a mental health issue. And so it, it doesn't avoid people that are millionaires or avoid people that are tough. But if we don't accept the fact that Rick Rippon uh, was weak because he succumbed to suicide, then how do we expect that any other average person can be tough enough to just get up and get over it? Now, Rick did some good work when he knew, he admitted he had a mental health issue. He created mindcheck.ca. My son, Kevin, went on to be the spokesperson. He's got a pretty good message here that'll help me wrap up. I'm the friend of someone who experienced depression. I know it isn't a choice. It's not a weakness, self-inflicted, or a result of not trying. Sometimes you just can't get over it. It won't just go away. Pretending it isn't happening doesn't help. Talking about it does. Getting support early can make the difference. Helping someone we care about is not a burden. I pledge to learn the signs. I will not judge. I will have compassion. I will reach out, listen, talk, help, and find help. My name is Kevin Bieksa. I will not stay silent. Add your voice at mindcheck.ca. There isn't a single person in this room that can't make a difference when you go back to your workplace on Monday. You just gotta have the will to do it. Some people are scared because they think that one individual or just a couple of you because you don't hold high positions in the company won't make a difference. You will, you will. You start to change your attitude, you will start to infect other people's attitudes. We've seen it over and over and over again in our society, but it's gotta start somewhere. There's a lot of people about nervous about being those kind of first people. And let me remind you of this. Some of you know this. It was amateurs that built the ark and professionals that built the Titanic. You can do anything that you have the will to do. Thank you very much.